Hi. Buongiorno. Parlo un po' d'italiano. Some of my friends say to me, parlo un po' inglese. So I'm going to do this in English. Thank you, Marco, and thank you, Alberto, um, mostly for allowing my students uh, and me to, to be part of this. Where would you rather be yesterday and today? Here or at the G20? <laughs> Come on, which one's more exciting? Where should the journalists be? Here. Here. What should be on television, on the news? Mind the bridge. Somebody's always marketing. Um, what if a sophisticated set of presentations we just saw and what we saw yesterday? So uh, I have the pleasure of uh, making a few remarks. I know I'm the only thing standing between you and lunch. So I will keep that in mind. I have seven questions that matter most of us to us um, as teachers at Stanford of this subject, or at least I think uh, they matter most to me, and I try to stress with the entire team. Uh, at this very moment, um, you're meeting some of the students. These are undergraduates from Stanford that are studying in Florence this uh, autumn. And I have the pleasure, of, if you heard, to be here with them. Um, back in S Silicon Valley, which you know, I hope you agree, it's a state of mind, it's a philosophy of business and economics. Back there, we have simultaneously going on about uh, 12 uh, courses for science, engineering, and humanities majors. Uh, probably another, uh, you know, 10 or so, eight or 10 in the business school and a few more even in the medical school and law school having to do with economics and I mean uh, entrepreneurship and uh, innovation. How many of you took a course in entrepreneurship and innovation when you were in university? How many? Look how small a number that is. I have some good news for you. In some parts of the world, it's changed dramatically. Those numbers I just gave you of what's happening at Stanford are just one example. My alma mater is University of California, Berkeley. It teaches a similar number. And be, thanks to our reach and our awareness, uh, this is taking place on all parts of the globe. So yesterday, I don't know what struck you, and I hope, I'm sure there's something that you heard yesterday or even this morning, the wonderful panel we had earlier, something you're going to take away, some lesson learned from this conference. But for me, it was that moment when the person talked about, wow, wouldn't it be nice if we could teach this in, in uh, the university? Wouldn't it be nice? Well, we can, and it's happening. So that's my little uh, wish, my dream, my, uh, my passion since 1995. Um, but when I arrived at Stanford, but we have, uh, we've come a long way, but we have a long way to go this uh, decade, and it will fit perfectly with um, all the other dreams and passions that have been shared up here over the last two days about an entrepreneurial economy, specifically Italy. Italy. So here's what we've been doing down in Florence. These uh, Stanford students and I have been learning some of these concepts I'm going to share with you, which is seven of my favorite things that we try to convey about what it means to be a, a, on, involved with a, with a startup, whether it's an independent startup or a part of a corporation or you know, nonprofit. Uh, but we also have been um, studying in this course that we brought the students up and that you see here um, about comparing on to the Silicon Valley ecosystem and climate to Italy. So we've been having a lot of fun doing that. So you can imagine this is an uh, absolute gold mine for us in that course. So one of the things we try to do is, yes, we are study the Silicon Valley um, philosophy, but being in Florence uh, has been uh, exciting. Or being in Italy to look back and spend a, lot of, a little bit of time studying the Renaissance. I don't know if you have plans to be in Florence between now and January, but I urge you to go to this exhibit at the Palazzo Strozzi that is co-created by a fellow who lives here in Milan named Tim Parks. He wrote a book called Medici Money, where he takes a good look at and the exhibit's called Money and Beauty. Uh, and it's a study of what went on in the 1400s and 1500s during the Renaissance, the parallels in banking 
in other words, commerce and creativity and the arts will blow your mind. And so I, have you, anybody been there yet to that exhibit? Well, my students have, because we, yeah, we went last week. I urge you to be there, it'll be there until January, and the Palazzo Strozzi is a wonderful thing. But also urge you to take a look at this very um, easy to read book, uh, Medici Money, uh, and, have a, and, and I think you'll, you'll agree. So we've gotten lots of inspirations, but speaking of inspiration, it's really, you know, to be an entrepreneurship professor, and a little bit of a recovering entrepreneur myself um, at Stanford is uh, something else. You get to claim credit for all these companies that have been incubated by, uh, at the university. Okay, I'll claim credit for them. No, so these, these are engineering, uh, um, tie, I mean, tie story engineering school, but of course there's been a number of them uh, from the medical school. So what, this has been going on for about 70 years. I've had the uh, joy of being in Silicon Valley um, uh, 30 years, and uh, at half of it, I, I helped get Symantec underway when I was three years old. And then uh, 15 years ago or 16 years ago, had a chance to switch to being a, a professor. So let's just get to the fundamentals. I can tell by this, you know, the sophistication of my friends here in the investment community, or especially the entrepreneurs and who I celebrate in the room that did those presentations, you've had a lot of training and a lot of mentoring and education over the last few months, haven't you? And it's benefited because those, there's some amazingly polished uh, um, pitches. I hope everything I'm about to say for the next half hour, and I brought along some friends to help me with, by video, um, seems obvious to you, because that, that would be good. But now I'd like you to be inspired to say, you know, wouldn't it be nice if my employees or the people, that, the services that we contract to, to help us or, or you know, get, build a line, uh, relationships with to help us, wouldn't it be nice if they understood this? And I'm, everything I'm about to show you is what we use to teach undergraduates, master's students, PhD students, even um, adult or postgraduate students who have been in, mostly in a laboratory uh, building breakthroughs in science and technology and now want to learn about entrepreneurship. So it can be taught, just like you see these wonderfully refined um, pitches today and sophisticated uh, entrepreneurs yesterday and today. It can be taught, so I want to show you some of the basics. But more importantly, this is an intensely personal question. What is entrepreneurship to you? And we, I, I realize, I want to be, keep this quick. Just think about it for a moment. And, and let's see that by the time I'm done in 20 or 25 minutes, then um, did I cover it? Did I miss anything? Because I'd like to ask you, did I miss, in, in choosing my seven favorite things, what did I miss? So let's just turn this into one big giant classroom. And uh, hopefully it'll be inspirational to you and maybe you'll learn a little bit along the way. So let's get inspired right away. Probably the hot, one of the hottest companies on the planet right now is called Twitter. So enough of me. Let's see if we can get inspired by, uh, by Mr. Dorsey. He's the founder of Twitter and Square. These are all from our site. The biggest thing for me on that, on that path is I need, to, I need to draw something out, and I need to get it out of my head. I found myself very early on thinking about something, like you know, thinking about this, this early idea for Twitter, and saying to myself, I could build this awesome, you know, you, you have those like shower moments or you're walking at midnight in some town in New York City and you've got these amazing brand ideas. And, and then you start thinking, well, I could really start doing this if only X and if I had this person or if this technology existed or if this happened or this happened. And what I, what I realized I was doing is I constantly making excuses for not working on it. And then the window had passed and then I couldn't do anything. So I think it's really, really important um, to write it out or to draw it out or to code it. Um, but you need to get it out of your head. And the reason you have to get it out of your head is you need to be able to see it on a surface that is not in your mind. And once you can see it and once you can step back from it, then you can also decide, uh, this is, you know, this passes my filter, passes my, you know, constraints. So maybe I can show it and share it with some other people. And then they'll be like, oh, you know, that's the stupidest idea ever. And, or, you know, that's somewhat interesting, um, but maybe this and this and this. Um, so the sooner you can do that, then you have a lot of momentum around it and you can, you know, really decide if you want to commit to it and work on it more or put it on the shelf 
for a later date. And the realization that I think everyone needs to have about that latter option, putting it on the shelf, is that you can come back to it. And it'll, it'll surface back up in another piece of work or another idea at some point in your life. So, you know, having that, having that ability to close off a chapter and move on is really, really important. You can't have all these open threads. And, and that's what I realized I was doing. And, and that also encouraged me to, to really write more and to really think about, you know, what is, what is the story? What, how are people coming to this? And like when I show my friends this, how are they going to react? And I would write it down. I, I would actually treat it like a play. Uh, and, and, and when I realized that I was writing plays, I, wrote, I read a lot more plays. Um, for style and for substance and for technique, and um, I think it's you know I think it's I think it's really good. And I think there's another company that I've always looked towards for um, inspiration. And uh, I know a number of people in this room probably have uh, a, this similar company in mind, which is Apple. Um, Apple, I think, is run like a theater company. Uh, it has a great sense of pacing, has a great sense of story, and has a great sense of execution and it's all about, it's all event driven, it's all stage driven. The stage being a billboard or the stage being a keynote or the stage being a product launch. Um, all of it has a very, very cohesive end to end story. I mean, you think about what happened when Steve Jobs came back to the company. The first thing he did is he killed every product line the company was working on. And for two, two years they had no product on the market whatsoever. All they had were a bunch of posters all around the world with Steve's heroes. And it said, think different. And it was just focused on bringing up the brand and making people aware of the brand again and how the brand is aligning to this particular feeling and story. And then they came out with the iMac and then you know, built, built iTunes and then the iPod. And they realized that, wait a minute, people are carrying music on their phones now, so we better build a phone iPhone and so this this unfolding of the plot and the epic story is, has been very very interesting to watch especially if you look back you know to that that time when he came back uh, to the company so I've learned a lot from that company um, and other companies who operate in a similar fashion so did those pitches that we've just seen you know were they born with that ability or did they learn how to tell that story because those stories were compelling Overall, you know, we, we could sort of discuss around the edges and, and which ones that got to you. But there's something about being able to tell a story. So my story today, for example, is that entrepreneurship can be taught, you know, for the rest of us. Of course, there's the Zuckerbergs and the Gates and, and uh, Richard Branson's and whatever. But there's the rest of us, mere mortals, uh, we can learn about this. And it's a wonderful thing. In addition to learning about Dante, I don't know how many of you were here yesterday. I did learn about Dante growing up, I promise you. So it's, it, it's a, it makes for a well-rounded education. So um, I've had fun doing a textbook over the last 10 years. It's in the third edition. It even has an Italian edition with, with, with a fellow from the uh, uh, University of Naples. But uh, we sort of break it down into, okay, are you talking, when you're talking about entrepreneurship, are you talking about opportunity recognition, evaluation, you know, this collision of, of products and, and markets, or are you talking about uh, the pursuit? So that, let's just have a, use that. And so these are my seven. There's some to do with, there's the opportunity and positioning stuff. There's the lean startup and cash um, capital area. And then the last ones in green are, are about the team. So let's have a look at each one of these. And of course, this will all be up on the web. Um, sorry for the very wordy slides, but let, let's step through each one. Why is a venture a true opportunity? And um, uh, you know, what we're trying to do in our classrooms, and I notice with my colleagues around the world who have built out these programs in entrepreneurship, is they uh, are using them to stimulate this generation to think big. And that's not too hard, given that we have a lot of crises. If Silicon Valley, and there's a common uh, the, the conventional wisdom of Silicon Valley was really developed because of the Cold War. That was the crisis that stimulated a lot of the investment um, over the last you know, 60 years. Okay, so what kind of crises might build out Silicon Valley type uh, clusters in the world now? Well, we got a lot to choose from. And this generation is, is pretty in t attuned to that. So that is a big, big pull. Um, on the push side, 
you know, I know this is a, not a, a, a couple of days to talk about science, but there's wonderful science going on, not only at the, our peer institutions in, in the United States, but everywhere I get to visit, including here in Italy. And it, we could have had two days just asking some of the, uh, the professors and their labs to come in and show off. It, it would be, it'd be pretty dramatic, and I guess this afternoon we'll talk a little bit about that, about the transfer. So this is a uh, diagram we threw in the last edition of the book, so it's a little dated, but it just shows there's been lots of waves of technology for centuries. I got lucky to be part of one with uh, the Symantec uh, story, you know, whatever. It's being called the fifth wave by this uh, author. Uh, the sixth wave was, this is, again, circa 2004, but you probably... Um, already know that there's lots of waves to catch, and it's much easier to start a company with the wind behind your back, as they say. But there's certain rules and laws, and it's fun to watch the investors today uh, ask the types of questions. What we uh, are lucky to have is you know, access to folks like uh, Jack Dorsey of Twitter or people like Mark Andreessen, and I'm assuming you know who that is from the Netscape days. Um, he's now an investor. We, we, this is the type of training we can do in a classroom with anyone. So let's have uh, Mark, and all these, of course, available for free on the e-corner, our uh, entrepreneurship corner up on YouTube. So let's, let's, let's see. Here we go. Let's, let's see how remarkably similar this was to what we heard this morning. Well, so the general criteria for a successful high-tech startup... Um, in my view, there's, you see different sort of rules of thumb from different people, but the, the three big things you always come back to are, is, it, is, is there a big market? And, and by the way, that comes in two parts. Is there a big existing market that you think you can go after and sort of displace incumbents, or, is, is it, or do you believe there will be a new market that will be big? So big market. Um, is there a fundamental technology or economic change that causes you to basically justify having a new company? Um, and that's really important. Um, so, you know, and, and the way I always think about that is, is there a 10x change happening in the technology landscape? Um, is something 10x faster or 10x cheaper or 10x better? And if it's not 10x, we, we view as both VCs and entrepreneurs, we really have to ask ourselves, like, is it really worth doing? Because um, it's really hard. I mean, it's really hard to start new companies. To, to tell you my macro theory, new, new companies generally shouldn't exist. Um, um, existing companies are usually pretty good at what they do. Um, and so for a new company to exist, it not only has to, like, you know, come in, go, you know, go into business and bring a product to market, but it has to bring a product to market that's so much better than what already exists that it punches through the sort of status quo. Um, and you know, most customers in most markets are pretty happy buying from the current suppliers. And so there has to be a real kind of edge uh, on the thing. And we look for that in either a technology change, usually a technology change or an economic change, um, which are often the same thing. Um, and then the third is team. Is, is the team outstanding? And if you think about this as an entrepreneur, it becomes a question of the founding team. Um, you know, if, you know, some companies are solo founders and they can work. But generally, you know, most of us, like myself, who are human beings, are mortal. Um, you know, you want to have a founding team of, multi, uh, of, uh, of complementary skill sets. And so you want to have at least one super strong technologist, um, quite possibly more than one. Um, some of the best startups are actually more than one founding technologist. And then it often helps to have somebody who's like a product or who's a, who's a, a market or sales person or has a sort of really good understanding of business uh, on the team certainly helps a lot. Um, and so we sort of like at market product and team. Um, and, you know, the reality is you need all three. Um, I would say, interestingly, if you're going to compromise as an investor, if we're going to compromise on one of those, it would actually be the product. And the reason I say that is because a great market is a lot easier to make up for with iterative product execution um, than a poor market. Because the problem with a poor market, a small market, is even if you do a great job on the product, there just aren't that many customers. It's hard to ever get big. So story and then the big three questions, which fit well with what we've heard these two days. Next one is about positioning. Um, have you heard of a fellow named Steve Blank? Steve Blank? Try steveblank.com. He's a very, very popular blogger, author of a book called The Four Steps of Epiphany, and, and I was lucky to twist his arm to teach some courses for us uh, starting a few years ago. Uh, his philosophy, you know, or his way of explaining that you should be developing customers at the same time as developing a product has caught fire. And it's it really, especially with this generation, and that's fantastic. Whatever it takes to get people, as he puts it, to get out of the building, to go talk to customers and partners. And it's pretty obvious that at least the 15 startups we've been seeing have adopted that philosophy. So there are exercises that we can do as college professors in our classroom with little projects, and the students know that, and uh, the other course they're taking with us down in, um, in Florence, um, to, to uh, 
to do that kind of experimentation. There was a model before Steve became so popular called uh, Crossing the Chasm by Jeff Moore, another Stanford grad. Uh, actually, he was a literature major at Stanford. And this book has remained uh, popular e even after 20 years. And he talks about, well, that's fine if you've got those first set of customers, but ultimately success will come with getting across a chasm. And many, as we know, many, many startups in, in, in between. I've certainly had my own uh, experience with that. So we still, but this model can be taught as well. And that leads to the following basic fundamental tenet of marketing and sales. And there's probably nobody better to talk about it. And these are the pitches we've been hearing. But the person that uh, does a great explanation of this is, a, is another friend of ours, this guy Kawasaki, who um, has a number of books out, including the, his newest one, uh, Enchantment. So let's hear from him. This is from a while ago, but it just shows you that some of this material is uh, universal and timeless. And think about what we heard today against what he's about to talk about. The sixth thing is to niche thyself. Um, this is all the marketing you ever need to know. It's also probably all the R&D and product design you ever need to know. I think that this chart can explain basically all of marketing and product design. On the vertical axis is the ability to pr produce a unique product or service. On the horizontal axis is the value of that service or product to the customer. As you might suspect, this is going to be a two by two. And as you might suspect, you're going to want to be high and to the right. But let's go through the other corners first. The first corner is where you provide something of great value to the customer, but there are 10 other competitors doing it. At that point, you have to compete on price because it is not a unique product or service. It's an ugly place to be. Another corner is where you provide something and only you provide it, but nobody wants it. That's where you're stupid. <laughs> In lower and to the left is the absolute worst corner. That's where you provide something that nobody cares about and there are 10 ways to get it, and that's over here. That means you're a dot-com company. <laughs> the prototypical example of a dot-com company was the ability to buy dog food online. That's why there's a dog food picture. You know, at the height of the dot-com phenomenon, you could buy a case of dog food online for 10% than what you would pay for by driving to a brick-and-mortar store, a Pet Mart or a Petco, right? You could save 10%. However, dog food is so heavy that you would pay $10 in shipping, which would be more than compensate for the 10% discount. So in effect, the dog food was of no value to the customer buying it online. However, there were six ways you could do it. There was pets.com, mypets.com, epets.com, ipets.com, lastminutepets.com, discountpets.com. There are 16 ways to buy dog food for more than you would pay in a store. That explains the dot-com phenomenon. So the holy grail of positioning in product design and marketing is to figure out how the hell you get into that corner where you are the single white tulip in a field of crappy other tulips. <laughs> how do you do that? What is so unique about your product or service? It can be features, it can be price, it can be geographic location, it can be service levels. I don't know what it is, but whatever it is, how is it unique? And by the way, that unique element better be valuable to the customer. An example of a company that I think is very high and to the right is Fandango. So Fandango allows you to buy a movie ticket before you go to the movie. So you really know you have a ticket and you can just zip through the line because they scan your printed out ticket, right? That's great value to the customer. And you can only buy it through Fandango. That company is high and to the right. So the basic proposition here is for you to be high and to the right. So, Guy Kawasaki, Jeff Moore, Steve Blank, all saying essentially the same thing. This uh, is a, a very, very important. And what I was listening for over the last two days with these pitches was exactly that. Could I see a more or less a first sentence where what was the universal value? Excuse me, universal value. Thanks. Um, a, a value to the customer, the x-axis that. Guy was talking about. 
And then could I see a differentiation? So that could be that single white tulip in a whole field of crappy tulips. Love that quote. Um, so we do this in class. And uh, the, t the students came up. Have you heard of Tesla? Yeah. This attempt. And I, this was a cute one. I thought it would be fun to do this here in Italy. Uh, for wealthy individuals and car aficionados and one environmentally friendly car, it's an electric automobile that delivers unprecedented performance. So there's that x-axis. I, I'm an engineering professor, so I love this kind of stuff, x-axis. And then the y-axis, the differentiator, unlike Ferraris and Porsches, uh, has fantastic mileage and parallel performance. At least that's the positioning statement. So the students came up with that. And that was a exciting, that, that engaged them. They said, oh, that's marketing and sales. Oh, you know, that more or less, I would say that's strategy in a startup. It's bigger than marketing sales. It's just the basic strategy of the startup. So we can do that. So if we... Um, I, my exercise to you for the, the startups that are here, um, if, uh, to try that template, I, you, I, although I think you've uh, nailed it. Let's go to the third one. Uh, this is where the lean startup philosophy starts to uh, come in, and that's a wonderful new term, a, a term that uh, is, is new, but the philosophy has been around for a long, long time. We have a lot of fun explaining to students that entrepreneurs and investors are not adversarial. They, they get on the same side of the table. As we, you know, we, as we talk to, but the startups we're talking about, which are these, these uh, enterprises that scale uh, to great levels. So they talk about something called the white hot risk to reduce as soon as possible. To, to, to celebrate Galileo's sign, you know, um, uh, scientific method approach to, to stuff. So um, we can uh, do exercises. And man, I hope this sounds familiar to my students in here. If it's not, where have you been in October in class? Um, that uh, we talk like this. We set up these role plays in class uh, between uh, you know, a mock kind of uh, discussion between investors and entrepreneurs. And of course, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful way to learn negotiation skill, regardless of whether somebody ever actually gets involved in entrepreneurial endeavors uh, downstream. Uh, but they'll be much more sensitive to know what goes on. So we pick one of these risks. And the only thing I would say about these uh, discussions, and again, there were five minutes, but it would be, look, the money I'm raising for is because we have determined in 2012, this is our white hot risk. Or, you know what I mean? Does that translate? Red hot risk? The most important risk? The, the, the hypothesis to be tested right away. Um, and so it might be team, it might be technology, it might be any of these. We're halfway through. Is this working? Okay, you can always cut me off. I'll go to lunch. I'll get, I'll get Marco back. He can entertain anybody. Um, this is an interesting question because people who've had a career in large organizations have trouble with this. It seems obvious to everyone in this room because we're the converted. We, we, are, we are way up the learning curve. But we have an exercise we do, especially if we're teaching adults um, an executive ed, is say, okay, write down right now, and we could do that. And uh, for those of you in the room who are at established enterprises, how, how much cash or you know, liquid investments d does your enterprise have right now? I mean, you could do that to me and say, okay, how much cash does Stanford have in the bank right now, the university? And I would think, I have no idea. I mean, I have a rough idea of our endowment, but cash, because I just don't think that way. We're just not going to run out. How many entrepreneurs in this room know the exact cash balance right now in their accounts? So it's, just a, it's just different. It's just like being a student again. How many students in this room now have the exact cash balance? Exactly. It's much more like being a student is a perfect, perfect training ground on how to manage the books as an entrepreneur. Because it's, it's going back to that period where every euro, every dollar counted. Um, now, putting the kidding aside, or the fun thing, it's, it's really healthy to see that those of us who are teaching entrepreneurship at the university level have gotten beyond business plan as the most important thing about entrepreneurship, that this, there's some document or some optimized pitch deck. Um, the conversation is completely changed, and what we're doing, we're reacting to it. And when I say we, I'm not just Stanford. I mean, those of I mean, 
Paris is here from Madrid, which I always love to say. My good friend Paris, who teaches at IE Business Schools here from Madrid, and whether it's Madrid or Beijing or wherever, um, it's much more a discussion about business and the search for a business model because business plans are only uh, temporary. All agreed? So I, a good way of putting this is a fellow at, uh, named Randy Komisar who's at a venture firm called Kleiner Perkins. He wrote a wonderful book, Monk and the Riddle, years ago, but now he's written a new book by a professor at London Business School named uh, John Mullen. So let's just hear from him about this whole topic. Hi want to recognize the fact that your new book that just came out with John Mullins, Getting to Plan B. Yeah. Now, the interesting thing about that book is that the assumption is that all business plans are really plan A, and it's very unlikely that they're going to succeed. So um, are all business plans a work of fiction? Yeah, the, you know, it's, it's, I'm going to take one step back on John Mullins because John Mullins was brought to me by Tom Byers. John Mullins was here from the London School of, um, of Business. Yeah, about 2006 or seven, and he was working on a thesis around business models. And he came to me with this idea that there was a way to sort of methodically map business models for startups. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I doubted that. Uh, and so we ended up in a debate, and the debate became this plan B phenomena, which fundamentally was around the notion of, could you actually build a business plan before there was a product? Could you build a business plan before there was a customer? Um, and in my experience, that didn't work very well. And so we went out and did the research. And the research suggested that, in fact, the vast majority of plan A's fail. And the vast majority of the successes that we think about out there, the Googles of the world, the, the Facebooks of the world, um, the Intuits, the Suns, the Apples of the world, they didn't succeed with plan A. And that's sort of a little known fact. Uh, most people sort of sweep that under the, the carpet and sort of talk about these companies as if they had executed um, well from the idea to conception, from conception to product, from product to customer, from customer to business. That's not the way it normally goes. And so the premise behind Plan B, uh, getting to Plan B, the new book that uh, we just I just wrote with John Mullins, is that if Plan A is most often fail, which they empirically do, then should we have a different methodology? for how we, in fact, run startups and get to the right plan, plan B. I don't know how you're feeling right now, but I hope you're, you know, all this may sound obvious to you because you're, we've got a sophisticated audience, but I hope you're thinking, wow, there's a lot of material available. So, John, let me just share with my cohorts, whoever they are, my stakeholders, my constituencies. And, um, you know, I'm, of course, particularly obsessed about college students, but I hope you're beginning to say, like, wow, there's a book called Getting to Plan B that lays out what goes in a dashboard or, you know what I mean, a, a controlling set of metrics and financials for these types of companies. I didn't know that. I hope that's beginning to be a little bit of epiphany for you because Randy's book is very, very good. I mean, the other thing I hope it, does for the entrepreneurs in the room is what's going to be your plan B? Because plan A, maybe you already have a plan B, plan, plan C. Um, it would have been interesting today if we'd had more time with you to, to say, uh, okay, what was the original idea? And, how, and the, the cute word that's used now is pivot. How many times have you pivoted um, or changed uh, your fundamental stra strategy since you wrote or, or thought up your original business idea? Certainly as some hand tech it's called Symantec because we raised money to be an artificial intelligence software company. Symantec is, you know, Symantec, the, the, the you know, linguistic term. But then we came across this little opportunity called uh, antivirus, although we got accused of writing the viruses. I remember when we launched that. But I, I wasn't smart enough to come up with that idea, although I did think about it before my ethical side took over. No, we did not write the viruses, but we did come up with the antivirus software, and it created a big company in, in Symantec. But we, it was certainly our pivot to go from AI software to going out and killing viruses on networks 25 years ago. All right, so um, here we are. Let's get down to the people side. I want to I spend more time here in the last few minutes. So no matter what you do, I don't care if you're an investor or an educator, we're, we consider ourselves academic entrepreneurs and building these new kinds of programs and units, or more importantly in the room, the, you know, um, the entrepreneurs. 
what are you doing to turn that effective, uh, your group into a team? Because all this other stuff, all this strategy stuff and all this finance stuff doesn't matter. I don't know about you, but when I was watching the entrepreneurs up here, I, you know, it was the opportunity and the concept they were talking about, but often it was them. That's who excited me. It just, I said, wow, would I like to, would I like to be involved with them? I mean, that, that particular person or th that team. Um, so it's only going to work if, if, great, if they were kinetic and attracted me like that and I got this visceral response, then it's going to be up to them, though, to put together a team and not just the internal team, but all the relationships they have. So there's the famous picture. You've seen this a million times. Yeah, there's Bill Gates on the left, philanthropist, former entrepreneur. <laughs> and there's the Unabomber on the right, bottom right, better known as co-founder. Okay, this is where you're supposed to laugh, students. We had a deal. Good grief. There's Paul Allen on the bottom right. He's not the Unabomber. He was the co-founder of Microsoft. I honor that. But they, they, there's the team. They would not be able to get through customs in the United States right now. How about that? Thank goodness. I think I made it one. Marco, you're so much better than I am at that. Um, it's, and so this professor at Berkeley, who's a friend, has a great way of putting it. And I told you, I'm an engineer. Um, so I love equations. That innovation is a function of the logical and of creativity and teamwork. So yes, te te cre having a wonderfully creative team is one okay. But without the team, it's not going to happen. It's a, it, one can't come without the other. One's uh, not a sufficient condition. So even Bill Gates would say that if he was here, other than the fact that I tell terrible jokes. Um, now, here's an intensely personal issue. And if we had more time together, I'd make you write it down and, and do some public commitment, is that what skills are you going to address to take advantage of this? We're going to come out of this all charged up today at 4.30 and onward. Um, but then it is about skill development. And it did not stop when you were 22 years old or getting out get a bachelor's degree or when you were 25 or 30 when you were getting your advanced degrees. It did not stop. It was, it's, it's lifelong learning. We have this way we, we share with our friends in the Design um, Institute at Stanford it has a good name called the D School. So if those of us at STVP are more or less the E School, and we are very, very close cousins or close brothers and sisters, and we have a nice way of putting this that's originated by uh, David and Tom Kelly at their design firm IDEO, and it's T-shaped people. It's now gone viral. That you know, it's wonderful to have a breadth of, I mean, a depth of knowledge in a particular discipline. There's no substitute for understanding something at a deep, deep, deep level. But that this, we can use teaching entrepreneurship and innovation leadership, just like um, classics ought to be taught. We could use this. Maybe, maybe it's I shaped. If you look at classics as a great general education, go deep in something, and then come out with a uh, um, another set of opportunities to learn in, uh, about entrepreneurship, innovation, leadership, and design. So these are my, uh, my list that I, I try to convey in the courses that I teach and with a nudge of the full-time and part-time faculty that are on our team. There's about 20 of them that I help organize. And uh, the ones in red are these strategic thinking skills. Did we, we saw some of those on display the last uh, few days. Uh, being you know, comfortable with change and stuff like that. There's obviously the communication skills there in the middle or interpersonal skills and that awful color of green um, and uh, that are important. And I was impressed by the, just the, the ability by these uh, founders to come up here and uh, communicate in this fashion. Um, and then, of course, everybody, since if business is such an important institution on this planet now, in addition to religion and in addition to government, uh, everybody ought to understand a little bit about the basics of accounting and finance. Everyone. It just should be fundamental to just be able to, to be part of uh, pushing this planet forward. So entrepreneurship can do that. But there's one that's not there, and let's just, let's just hit it, because we keep hearing about this in, in Florence as we study entrepreneurship in Italy. And frankly, it, it connects with even a good many parts of the United States, other kinds of regions. This is my colleague, Tina Seelig. I hope it comes across. This one is about risk-taking and being willing to fail. In fact, if you're not failing sometimes, you're not taking enough risks. And one of the things that we do that we're lucky about being in Silicon Valley <coughs> is that there's an incredible culture of risk-taking and a comfort with uncertainty and a willingness in this area to um, embrace failure 
and to learn from failure. This is certainly not the case around the world. There are many places in the world where if you fail, I mean, you really feel like you need to just sort of change your name and move somewhere else. It's not okay. But here, we are very much encouraged to learn from our mistakes and to do it again. In fact, there are many, many people who have started one company that has fa have failed and then gone on to do something else and been very successful. And uh, people look at them and say, you know, what did you learn from that failure? Great, you won't do that again. So Tina is our executive director at STVP, and that book, What I Wish I Knew When I Was 20, have you heard of it? It's good. Yeah, it's, it's really good. It's, it's a nice short read, but it's well-researched. Chapter 5 is called The Secret Sauce of Silicon Valley. And that was, she just previewed Chapter 5 there. It's the willingness to fail. That it's not personalized. It's not personalized. We... You, um, I've certainly failed, I could tell you my stories, but what I'd rather you do right now is think, when did you fail? And she has a wonderful exercise she does in her classes, which is write a failure resume. <laughs> Not your CV or bio or resume, you know, all those cute ones in our, God, we should next time make us do that, Marco, and uh, pay attention, I'm, I'm not finished. Um, <laughs> Mark, Marco and Alberto, I have, a, I have a idea for you. There should be a blurb about, you know, Tom is yeah, 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 yeah. And then I should have to submit my failure bio. And, in, and you know, one or, well, there's more than one or two things I could choose from, but what I learned from it. And it's a very powerful exercise. So I challenge you today at lunch, during conversation, go up to somebody and say, I'm going to tell you when I failed and what I learned from it. That'll, that'll be an interesting lunch. You, okay? Let's do that. Come on. Come on. I mean, if it's, I mean what the heck? Be the most, it would, it's not what you thought you were going to do at lunch today. I guarantee you. Let's talk about your failures. But what you learned from it. So I'm just waiting for Tino to write the book, What I Wish I Knew When I Was 50-something. But she is uh, 20. Okay, that's a joke too, students. Jeez. All right. So um, let's get to the last one. How to make meaning or, or uh, purpose. Uh, we certainly want to do this in our personal lives, but this is, if, if telling a story, and these enterprises are going to be so important, and because you know when you get involved with entrepreneurship and innovation, you're all in. It's, it's like being a chef. It's like being on a sports team. It's not, it's not something that it's just for the timid. It's every, and, and everybody associated with them has to be all in. It's going to be working harder than you'd ever ha imagine. So it better make meaning. And I like this concept of scaling a vision. So let's hear probably from the person that deserves as much credit for where Facebook is now as the hottest you know, enterprise on the, can on, the, uh, on the planet, at least private enterprise, let's put it that way. Um, and, it, and it goes back to some wonderful books um, by Jim Collins, one in the 90s called Built to Last, one in the last decade called Good to Great, and now he has a brand new book just launched last week that I highly recommend for this decade. But clearly Cheryl, who's the CEO, CEO, excuse me, of Facebook and Mark's uh, colleague and ex-Google employee, I should say that, um, has something to say about this. And it's been incredibly inspirational for our students. So there's a lot of talk about how to run organizations. And people who are smart about this separate out management and leadership. And they talk about management as things like the science of administering a business. And it has this very best practices kind of uh, theme to it. And I hate those terms. And I can hate them because I was a consultant. So I'm, I always make fun of consultants and business school students because I was both. But it has that very consultant thing. But it really is the kind of one plus one equals two. If I do this, the company does this. If I do this, the company does that. It's a science. And then there's this leadership thing. And this leadership thing always has this kind of more art or more magical idea towards it. And what it is, I think, you know, it's the art of administering a business so that people, uh, sorry, the art of accomplishing more than the science of management teaches you is possible. With management and with authority and with, you know, structures all businesses and organizations have, you can get people to do things. You work for me, I ask you to do A, you're likely to do A. But while you can get compliance, you can't get passion. You can't get true excitement. 
That's what leadership is. Leadership is ha- helping people or finding a way to convince a group of people that are working together on something, or in some cases aren't working very well together, to follow what the mission is, what you want, to follow whatever it is with true enthusiasm. And it is that enthusiasm which transcends science, which makes it seem like one plus one equals three, not two. So people talk a lot about, well, how do you get there? How do you be a great leader? And I think it's a lot of things, and I don't pretend to have the answer. But it's a bunch of things about who you are as a person. People follow people they respect and trust. If you don't have respect and trust, you don't have any hope of being a great leader. Some of the stuff are skills you can learn. People look at people who are great speakers, who are really convincing orators, and they say, wow, I want to follow that person. People who can tell great stories, great narratives. But when you take all the personal stuff aside, there's something else that's really important to great leadership, which is the purpose of the leadership. And that's what I mean by scaling a vision. That you can lead all day long, but if you're leading people to you know, make soap, that's important. But does it have that, I want to follow this, I want to you know, serve this mission until the end of my life, I want to stay up all night and work all day to serve that mission. It's having a great vision that I think becomes the basis of real leadership. And that vision has to be one that scales, that can take you from where you are to the more than foreseeable future. So it's not just business models that these startups are looking for, but it's also being able to scale their vision. So there they are. There's the seven that uh, I took um, uh, liberty of um, sharing with you. And I uh, asked you a little while ago to think about what is entrepreneurship? What does it mean to you? And I hope that um, I'm going to watch the time here, but I hope uh, we'll we'll talk about it this afternoon if you want, about something that I might have missed, something that you feel passionate about. I urge you, there's the, the old-fashioned way of learning books, both uh, you know, in hard copy and online on the Kindle versions, there they are. I urge you to come take a look at uh, our videos, which we've, ed- we've been the, you know, done a little bit of editorial on, just pulled them together, tagged them, both on our site and YouTube. They're all there. There's a couple of thousand. So if, in other words, if you liked what you just saw by Sheryl Sandberg, we have 20 of those types of clips, all tagged. Um, and they can be used uh, for your own learning as well as those uh, that you work with. And um, of course, the blogs are wonderful, but um, there's some that are more wonderful than others, as I mentioned. And I'm, I'm inspired to be in Milan uh, today and honored and, and pleased to, to be where Leonardo spent so much of his life. And I, I just came across this quote as we went to uh, study him the other day with uh, my students in Florence. And I like that. Epic. It, long been, uh, it had, had long since come to my attention that people of accomplishment rarely sat back and let things happen to them. They went out and happened to things. And it reminds me of this great quote by a hippie DJ in San Francisco, uh, which goes with the territory, um, that used to say, if you do not like the news, go out and make some of your own. So the news is very odd nowadays this year. <laughs> including what we probably looked at when you got up this morning on any some sort of feed. So if you do not like the news, I hope you'll go out and uh, make some of your own. And that includes influence those universities that you have uh, reached to to teach this material. So we'll have even more productive events like this in the future. So there you have it. Thanks so much.